Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem. This is Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. All our lectures are available on YouTube. There's a Telegram group for accessing all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive, whereupon all the lecture PDFs are available. These are the disclaimers. We are with phase three, which is recorded pathology lectures. And we are with Pursue 26, which is dermatopathology. And today we have Pursue 26 C1, which is a slide seminar. And to speak on this slide seminar, we have Dr. Nadia Shirazi. She's an MBBS and MD from AMU Aligarh. Presently, she's a professor in the Department of Pathology at the Himalayan Institute of Medical Science, Jolly Grant, Dehradun. Her areas of interest is dermatopathology and oncopathology. She has got more than 115 publications in international and national journals, was awarded the Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum Award for Medical Sciences, Dubai in 2016. She also got the Best Teacher Award in 2022 at the Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences, Dehradun. She has also done a fellowship in oncopathology from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai in 20, 2007. She is also an executive member of the Dermatological Society of India. Today, Dr. Nadia Shirazi will be taking a slide seminar on, uh, se seminar on intriguing dermatopathological cases. So I would request Dr. Nadia Shirazi to start her lecture, ma'am. Please start. Thank you. A very good day to all my dear listeners and students. Today, I will be discussing five interesting cases of dermatopathology and will be discussing briefly about their literature as well. So as you should know, what are these entities? So the first case is was that of a 12 year old girl. She was born out of non consanguineous marriage and presented with multiple atrophic scars and blisters on face, scalp, hands and feet. It was congenital and parents had noted this since birth. She also used to pass reddish uh, colored urine since 10 days of age. So that was also congenital. And on examination, we can see that she had multiple scars, some of which were bleeding on the face, scalp, here on the eyebrows, on the ear lobules, as well as lips and neck. You can also see there is a yellowish discoloration of the sclera. Her teeth were reddish brown and her finger and toenails were distorted. Physical and mental development was subnormal for her age. There was no scarring of cornea or conjunctiva. She had two other siblings who were unaffected and parents and other family members were unaffected. On Wood's lamp examination of teeth, we could see erythrodontia, that is reddish coloration of skin uh, of the nails, which was showing bright red fluorescence. Her nails, you can see distorted fingernails and scarring of her hands. Her feet also, also showed scarring and ulceration and blister with healing in the feet. So we can see the sides affected were the sun exposed sides of her body. That is the face, scalp, hand, feet. Some of the blisters were bleeding as well. On examination, there was hepatosplenomegaly. The spleen was 2 cm enlarged below the coastal margin. However, there was no other systemic abnormality. And on hemogram and GBP, there were signs of hypersplenism, that is, uh, it, it was a kind of pancytopenia. Her hemoglobin was severely low, that is 4.2 gram percent. TLC was almost uh, uh, in the normal range. However, uh, the platelets were reduced, 80,000 per cubic mm. Upon peripheral blood smear, there was a loss of red cell mass, severe reduction of red cell mass moderate anisopoikilocytosis that is uh, there was deviation in the size and shape of rbcs there was polychromasia few target cells few broken rbcs or schistocytes along with occasional nucleated rbcs 
her skin biopsy was done which showed a blister the uh, a, a bullous lesion it was a kind of a bullous lesion with atrophic epidermis and sub epidermal separation the dermis showed abundant acellular pinkish material in the dermis which was present almost entirely in the dermis along with perivascular deposition so these arrows are showing this amorphous eosinophilic material which was also seen around the perivascular distribution this is amorphous eosinophilic material higher magnification you can see a sub epidermal separation and also deposition of this amorphous acellular eosinophilic material again we can see this separation of epidermis but there is no acantholysis no acantholytic cells or a fluid filled bulla that wasn't the case over here it was just a separation which was predominantly sub epidermal even the hair follicle showed this kind of sub epidermal clefting we performed a pass stain per iodic acid shift stain which showed bright magenta colored positivity in the dermis which was indicative of deposition of porphyrins so this perivascular deposition of porphyrins was also seen you can see this magenta color deposition around the vessel walls so a diagnosis of congenital erythropoietic porphyria was rendered this patient was discharged after four unit of blood transfusion to achieve adequate hemoglobin levels and she was advised to avoid sun exposure as much as possible topical sunscreens to be taken liberally and oral beta carotene could help however not significantly and she was advised so bone marrow transplant was advised but that attendants re attendants refused because of financial constraints and patient has been asked to come for regular follow ups for symptomatic therapy particularly blood transfusion so what is porphyria porphyria is derived from the greek word porphyra which means purple pigment so congenital erythropoietic porphyria was first described by gunther in 1911 it is a rare inborn error of heme synthesis which is inherited as autosomal recessive disorder it is characterized by the deficiency of uroporphyrinogen 3 co-synthase or uros3 enzyme this is the fourth enzyme in the heme biosynthesis pathway as you remember your heme biosynthesis pathway that is synthesis of hemoglobin or or heme it is from glycine and succinyl coenzyme a and there is involvement of certain enzymes the deficiency of which result in porphyria so urose 3 enzyme which is involved in transition of uroporphyrinogen 1 2 3 is deficient in congenital erythropoietic porphyria which is the case that we are discussing here so urose 3 enzyme is responsible for isomerization of hydroxymethyl bilane 1 and accumulation of biologically inert type 1 porphyrins particularly coproporphyrin 1 and uroporphyrin 1 these enzymes deposit mainly in skin rbcs bones and teeth and these porphyrins they are activated by light in the sorid band that is 400 to 410 nanometer and induce oxygen dependent phototoxic damage which is characterized by sub epidermal skin blistering with moderate to intense inflammation ulceration and hence developing of deforming scars on all sun exposed sites like the face neck scalp arms and feet and this is what we saw in our patient these porphyrias have been supposed to be inspired when people or movies are made on vampires and werewolves where they are said that these people they come out only at the night there is atrophic scars and there might be coloration discoloration of teeth reddish discoloration and they are not seen in the daytime so these patients are transfusion dependent and they show features of hypersplenism 
However, late onset cases have milder cutaneous symptoms, they are not transfusion dependent and they may develop thrombocytopenia and myelodysplasia. Differential diagnosis is of epidermolysis bullosa, but porphyrin levels here are not raised. Pseudoporphyria, which is drug induced, but porphyrins are normal. Porphyra cutanea tarda, which usually presents in adulthood with skin blistering, but no erythrodontia. Hereditary coproporphyria, which is not seen before puberty, it is latent before puberty. These patients are managed by telling them to strictly avoid sun exposure. Therapy is usually symptomatic, which results in repeated blood transfusions for hemoglobin sustenance and maintenance. Splenectomy can be done to counter hypersplenism, especially in milder phenotypes. Bone marrow transplant is currently considered the best treatment option because the new bone marrow cells having the normal copy of Uros gene, they will overtake the defective population of red cells and start producing normal erythroid precursors. So this was about congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Now coming to my second case. A 10 year female, she presented with multiple skin colored to reddish brown papules on trunk, abdomen and back since one month. These are reddish brown papules on the trunk and also on the back. There was no fever, cough, anorexia or weight loss. The past and family history were non-contributory. There was no significant lymphadenopathy or organomegaly. Her lab investigation showed mild to moderate anemia and a raised ESR. A strongly positive tubercular reaction was seen. However, serology for HIV, HBS, HCV and syphilis were all non-reactive. Her dermoscopy showed these hypopigmented areas. Skin biopsy showed partly thinned out epidermis on one side and there was abutting of some kind of these granulomas on the epidermis. Also we can see epithelioid granulomas throughout the skin. Here also you can see granulomas, some granulomas and dense lymphocytic infiltrate along with this residual hair follicle around which also there is this kind of inflammation. So this is a better magnification, a higher magnification showing well-defined epithelioid granuloma in the dermis. As we all know, a granuloma is composed of five things, epithelioid cells, lymphocytes, Langhans giant cells, fibroblasts with or without caseous necrosis. So this case showed a typical granuloma. However, the caseous necrosis was scanty, but you can see here the Langhans giant cells, the epithelioid cells, lymphocytes and fibroblasts. So this is what you see in this skin biopsy. Here also we can see a Langhans type giant cell and modified macrophages or epithelioid cells. So uh, this is again epithelioid cells and a granuloma. You can see the some of these granulomas, they tend to be around the hair follicle. So on finding these granulomas, we performed a ZN stain, which was negative for AFP. And hence the diagnosis rendered was lichen scrofulosorum because she was having well-defined granulomas, a strongly positive tuberculin test and a negative uh, ZN stain. So these are lichen scrofulosorum belongs to a group of tuberculids. Tuberculids are cutaneous hypersensitivity reactions in patients which are suffering from occult or apparent systemic TB. Clinically, three true tuberculids are identified, papulonecrotic tuberculid, erythema induratum of basin and lichen scrofulosorum. So our 
focus is lichen scrofulosorum over here because uh, this was typically seen in a young adult with strong positive tuberculin test. Lichen scrofulosorum was first described by Hebra in 1868, especially in children and young adults with TB and a strongly positive tuberculin reaction. It is also known as tuberculosis cutis lichenoides. The patient presents with asymptomatic yellowish papules on trunk which heal without scarring. It is often associated with tubercular lymphadenitis or organ TB like osteomyelitis. It has also been documented following BCG injection in AIDS patients. The differential diagnosis is like in nitidus in which the lesions are more shiny and they tend to be acral in distribution. Keratosis, spinulosa, the lesions have spiny projections. Keratosis pilaris, where the individual papules are predominantly scattered over proximal limbs and elbows. Follicular myco mycosis fungoides, it is seen in an older age group and non-involuting nature of lesions over time. Papular sarcoidosis, micropapular syphilids and drug, drug eruptions also constitute a differential of lichen scrofulosorum. These, these are particular clinical differentials which can come to you when a form is being sent. So these are most of the asymptomatic follicular or perifollicular lesions. Investigations done the biopsy will usually reveal non-caseating granulomas in dermis and around hair follicles. ZN is usually negative for AFB. PCR can be done in lesional specimens. Montux and quantiferon gold assay, which are the tests of cellular immunity against microbial antigens, often turn out to be positive. So a thorough clinical and laboratory evaluation should be performed to find out the underlying focus of mycobacterial infection. The patient responded well to anti-tubercular therapy. So the treatment is standard four drug anti-tubercular therapy like isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutol and pyrazinamide. The eruptions usually clear within four to six weeks of therapy. So now I am coming to case number three. The third case is that was that of a 55 year old male he was farmer by occupation and a resident of Gadwal region of Uttarakhand he presented with reddish raised lesions over the left arm for five to six years he had those lesions since a long time the lesions had started as tiny raised and then progressed over the years to present sized initially the lesions were small and he thought that they will soon uh, 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 subside but they didn't and the lesions have assumed the present size there was he also gave a history of trauma while working in the fields prior to development of these lesions there was no fever or spl uh, splenomegaly or night sweats or any other thing no constitutional symptoms no lymphadenopathy the patient was non-diabetic and immunocompetent on examination, we saw this 5 to 6 cm size ill to well defined erythematous plaque with overlying scales and crusts, along with areas of atrophy present over dorsal aspect of the left forearm. On closer examination, we could see some tiny black dots. Some tiny black dots on, were seen on the crust. Dermoscopy also showed these tiny black dots and the skin biopsy showed beautiful epithelioid granulomas again along with areas of microabscesses. So here you can see multiple well-defined epithelioid granulomas in his dermis. So again, this epidermis is showing pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, hyperkeratosis, and the dermis is showing well-defined epithelioid granulomas. These are the epithelioid granulomas with Langens and some foreign body type giant cells of the horseshoe pattern of nuclei. There is 
dense lymphocytic infiltrate, there is necrosis. The necrosis appears to be fibrinoid and associated with inflammation. So you can see dense inflammation over here along with multiple epithelioid granulomas. But what was very interesting in this case was that these giant cells showed ingested brown copper penny like bodies. So here you can see copper penny like brown bodies ingested inside the giant cells. Again here we can see these brown copper penny bodies inside the giant cells. There were many of them. Here you can see a beautiful copper penny brown body inside the giant cell. So this is another a copper penny body and the surrounding area shows dense neutrophilic infiltrate. So copper penny, this is a brown colored body. So a diagnosis of chromoblastomycosis was rendered. Chromo means colored. So chromoblastomycosis is a chronic progressive subcutaneous fungal infection which is often caused by traumatic inoculation of dematiaceous fungi namely Fonseca pedrosae, Phyllophora verugosa, Cladophyllophora carinoeae, Rhinocladiella aquaspersa and Exophiella dermatitis. So the most important one is Fonseca pedrosae. The major etiological agent was named after Alexandrino pedroso who first described the disease in 1911. These fungi are found in soil wood and rotting vegetables. <coughs> These most cases of chromoblastomycosis are seen in the tropics and subtropics where there is higher prevalence of rainfall, annual rainfall. So you can see these red indicate red areas in tropics and subtropics. They indicate the maximum number of cases and many are also seen in India. There is a male predominance with a male female ratio being 4 is to 1. It is seen in the 40 to 70 year age group and less commonly seen in children. The mean duration of presentation is 5 to 6 years as was seen in our case. They are slowly growing, slowly evolving lesions following traumatic inoculation of fungus. Ye fungus, this fungus lives in the wood and soil. Site of involvement is usually lower extremities, arms, penile shaft, vulva, tonsil and ala of nose. Skin biopsy and fungal culture provide the correct diagnosis. Extracutaneous spread is also seen in lymph nodes, pleura, oral cavity, trachea, larynx and heliocecal region. Dermoscopy is important in this case which shows the presence of multiple reddish black dots which ascribes to the process of transepidermal elimination of inflammatory cells, fungal elements and hemorrhage which is seen clinically as black dots. Few yellowish orange structures are also seen which represent mycotic granulomas but these are not specific to chromoblastomycosis. The most important thing or the highlight of this disease is the presence of copper penny bodies. These are sclerotic bodies and also known as medullar bodies, muriform cells or meristematic cells which are easily demonstrated on HNE staining. And on KOH mount for fungus they, they can also be seen. These copper penny bodies, they represent an intermediate vegetative form which is between the yeast and hyphae. They need to be distinguished from pigmented artifacts due to formalin or hemosiderin. Chromoblastomycosis was initially thought to be related to blastomycosis. However, cellular division occurs by internal septation as we saw in few of the pictures uh, by, of copper penny bodies and not by budding as seen in blastomycosis. We can also uh, do Mason Fontana or GMS stain if we need to uh, visualize them better.
there are various clinical presentations of chromoblastomycosis like nodular, verrucous, vegetant, verrucous vegetant, tumor-like, cicatricial or scarring, and lymphangiitic or sporotrichoid lesions. The differential diagnosis can be tuberculosis verrucosa cutis in which you see pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia but there are no copper penny bodies. Sporotrichosis which also follows trauma usually in the soil or thorn prick. This, uh, you see uh, sporotrix bodies in sporotrichosis. In blastomycosis, as we saw, we see, uh, as we just discussed, we see budding forms. Leishmaniasis, we see LD bodies and plasma cells. And in lichen planus hypertrophicus, uh, it is a close DD because of that pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, dense chronic inflammation, but you don't see a granuloma. And lupus vulgaris, which is usually seen in the face, TB of skin involving the face. This is the cauliflower-like appearance over here. This is the growth-like appearance on the foot. And on KOH mount, you can see these colored copper penny bodies or the medlar bodies in which division is occurring by septation rather than budding. And here, so classic is the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and dermal granulomas with copper penny bodies or intermediate form between yeast and hyphae of chromoblastomycosis. The condition is characterized by secondary infection, lymphatic spread of the uh, uh, fungus along the lymphatics it can also spread and even squamous cell carcinoma if left untreated. A disseminated disease if involving the CNS it carries the worst prognosis. Long-standing cases are seen over joints which are usually, which if seen over joints and also having lymphatic involvement will show a higher morbidity. The treatment involves surgical excision followed by oral antifungal therapy that is etroconazole 200 to 400 mg per day terminophene and uh, the treatment is usually a bit prolonged, 6 months to 1 year and this is the medical treatment. So this was uh, my case on chromoblastomycosis. Now I am coming to the fourth case. Here, the fourth case is that of a nine-year-old boy. He presented with patchy hair loss since five months. You can see these patches. So on examination, four patches of non-scarring alopecia were present over the scalp. There was no past history of similar episode and no history of hair pulling and no similar complaint was seen in the family. So this is closer examination. On closer examination we can see this large area of alopecia patch or loss of hair, total almost complete loss of hair over these areas. So before coming to this discussion, we hope you remember there are uh, mainly three types of hair histologically the anagen, catagen and telogen. So anagen are the growing hair and they are seen in almost, they are seen in occupying almost 85% of hair of the scalp. The catagen is the involuting hair with a thick basement membrane and telogen is the resting hair. So these are the, this is the main type of hair. And we also know that otherwise there are two types of hair, the vellus hair and the terminal hair. Vellus hair are short hair with bulb located in the reticular dermis, whereas terminal hair are deep hair with bulb in the subcutis. The terminal hair are seen in scalp, axilla, pubic hair, etc. Whereas vellus hair are seen in rest of the body. <clears throat> so now coming to this case. We just talked about the normal histology of hair and the types of hair. Now coming to this case to make it uh, uh, so that we can realize what we are talking about. We are talking about large areas of hair loss in a small boy, in a nine-year-old boy. So the skin biopsy was done from scalp and this biopsy showed hair loss. <clears throat> there are small telogen follicles 
some telogen follicles are seen and small anagen follicles so as you know that uh, the main uh, things that we uh, the main type of hair that we see in scalp are, should be terminal hair that is terminal hair with their uh, bulbs located in the subcutis yahan pe there are they are over here the number of terminal hair is less there is loss of hair and not only a few of them are anagen hair that too with small follicles this <coughs> section shows fibrous tracts which are representing regressed hair follicles so we can see some fibrous tracts representing regressed hair follicles also there was peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate around a miniaturized anagen hair this peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate has been uh, has been uh, written to be resembling swarm of bee appearance uh, here also we can see fibrous tract which is extending along the side of a previous hair follicle yeah this is the hair follicle and these are fibrous tract around the hair follicles they are also see uh, here this is the higher view of the same fibrous tract along previous hair follicle one thing uh, one more thing that we need to, uh, to uh, observe over here that there is sebaceous gland atrophy there appears to be loss of sebaceous glands also in our case we saw this pigment deposition around around the miniaturized hair so this is by the sebaceous unit you can see some atrophy of sebaceous glands fibrous bands and pigment incontinence so <clears throat> in a nutshell the skin biopsy in this case showed the follicles to be more in the catagen and telogen stage as compared to the anagen stage there were few vertical fibrous tracts with melanophages in the subcutis in the subcutaneous tissue and lower dermis this represents regressed follicles in the upper part of subcutaneous fat we could see dense collection of lymphocytes which is swarm of bee appearance or peribulbar <coughs> lymphocytic infiltrate no scarring was seen so a diagnosis of alopecia areata was given now coming to what is alopecia areata it is a latin term which means baldness alopecia means baldness and areata means patchy nature of this baldness in this disease the hair falls out in small round patches leaving coin sized areas of bare skin alopecia can be either totalis involving the entire scalp scalp universalis that is involving the whole body and part of uh, in in patchy areas which is incognito alopecia areata affects almost one in every 500 to 1000 people so there is a high quite high incidence of this disease it affects males and females equally and it is the second most common form of alopecia after androgenetic alopecia so androgenetic alopecia or male pattern baldness or androgenic this is the most common form of alopecia and after that is the alopecia areata if a person has got first degree relatives and family members who have other autoimmune disorders they tend to be affected more the hair follicle is thinned out at the isthmus giving rise to exclamation mark sign so exclamation mark sign is a hallmark of alopecia areata we can also see nail changes like pitting thickening and ridging in almost 10 to 66% of cases so this diagram shows an exclamation mark here in which you can see the bulb the bulb is shrunken there is tapering and and then the uh, rest of it appears to be normally pigmented 
So this is an exclamation mark here and it is a feature of androge of alopecia areata. The, this uh, disease is attributed to variation in HLA genes which lead to inappropriate immune response and association is sometimes seen with autoimmune thyroid diseases, vitiligo and atopy. The immune system over here targets the hair follicles which stops the hair growth. So anagen here, that is why the anagen here are less seen in this case. However, the good part about it is it is not permanent. So what to look for in a biopsy when you are dealing with a case of hair loss? So a scalp skin biopsy, what to look for? The epidermal changes. You should look for the number of hair follicles, that is whether how many are terminal or how many are villous. As I told you, more hair in the scalp are terminal or more deep seated. You should also comment on the number of anagen, catagen and telogen hair follicles. Peribulbar inflammatory infiltrate should be commented upon. Perifollicular fibrosis should also be looked. Whether you are seeing miniaturization of hair or pigment casts, that should be commented in your report. Then the spacing of follicular units, whether they are evenly spaced or there appears to be some kind of loss of follicular units. Sebaceous glands, as I told you, there is a trophy of sebaceous glands in our case, that is in case of alopecia areata, whereas sebaceous gland hyperplasia is a feature of androgenetic alopecia. Then you should also look for dermal changes in the interfollicular areas, that is the nature of inflammatory infiltrate or if there is any other significant finding like some kind of uh, epithelioid granuloma or mucinosis as sometimes can be seen in SLE, the mucin thing. So uh, you should also comment on interfollicular dermis. So DD of non-scarring alopecia, alopecia areata is a non-scarring alopecia just like androgenetic alopecia. The pattern is patchy or diffuse whereas androgenetic will show bitemporal recession and vortex balding. Trichotillomania is a condition in which the patient starts pulling out his or her hair and telogen of effluvium in which also you can see um, diffuse a hair loss especially after major surgery, injury, severe illness, childbirth, crash dieting, etc. So this is a telogen, of, a telogen effluvium. What do you see in the histology of each of them? Alopecia areata will show a swarm of bees inflammation and shift out of anagen follicles. That is less anagen and more catagen. Otherwise, you will see more of anagen in any case. In androgenetic alopecia, there is decrease in terminal hair follicles and subcutaneous fat and there is variation of shaft diameter. Trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, you will see th there is no inflammation. However, you can see some pigment around the, uh, some but quite thick pigment around the hair uh, follicles. In telogen effluvium, there will be lack of hair follicle miniaturization and there will be more of telogen hair. So, uh, in a nutshell, what to look for in a patient of alopecia areata? You can see multiple patches of hair loss with exclamation mark hair. Then you can see a hair bulb with swarm of bee appearance of inflammation shift out of anagen that is most of the hair follicles even if present are in the telogen phase and there will be less amount of sebaceous glands and then anagen like nanogen hair follicle with no central hair shaft and perifollicular lymphocytes. Prognosis is poor especially if the onset is before puberty if there is association with atopy, down syndrome etc there is unusually widespread alopecia and if there is an ophiaciform type or a wave-like appearance of involvement 
of the scalp margin, particularly at the nape of neck. So the coming to the management, the management will depend upon whether the on the age of the patient. If there is less than, if the age is less than 10 years, therapy is usually topical steroid or some other uh, topical therapy uh, like uh, vomitazone, etc. If more than 10 years, then you should look for the body surface area involved. If less than 30%, intralesional triamcinicolone uh, uh, can be given. And if more than 30%, depending upon the duration, you can give topical therapy, steroid pulse therapy, even methotrexate therapy, or even other uh, 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 other um, medical management as suggested. And in simultaneously, patient should be treated for nutritional deficiencies like iron, zinc, B12, vitamin D. He should be worked up for thyroid diseases and complementary medicines can be given. For psycho psychological support, hair replacement like wig and hair, um, hair coaching to be given because these patients will often uh, uh, have psychosomatic issues. They will be going into depression. So we have to take care of that as well. So this was about alopecia areata. Now coming to my last case. Case number five. This was a 35, 31 year male who presented with rough reddish brown rashes, which were involving almost the whole body, particularly the trunk and abdomen since two weeks. These rashes were non-itchy. There was no fever or lymphadenopathy. So you can see these multiple slightly elevated rough reddish patches over the trunk and abdomen. So uh, the clinician initially thought of some type of leprosy, especially histoid leprosy, possibility of sarcoidosis or cutaneous T cell lymphoma and even syphilis were given. A biopsy was taken. The biopsy showed moderate to intense dermal mononuclear inflammation. So you here you see dense dermal inflammation and the perivascular areas showed a tight cuffing of mononuclear cells or a tight cuffing of inflammatory cells. This is called a perivascular coat sleeve pattern of inflammation. On higher magnification, we could see endothelial swelling, proliferation of endothelium and also inflammation of the uh, vessel leading to end arthritis. Higher magnification showed numerous plasma cells. There was no well-defined granuloma, but these plasma cells, they led to the diagnosis of secondary syphilis. So these plasma cells are seen extensively in the dermis. Here you can see numerous plasma cells and some kind of end arthritis and endothelial proliferation. So the diagnosis here was consistent with secondary syphilis. It was not Hansen's, it was not sarcoid and any other thing, it was secondary syphilis. So syphilis is caused by bacteria Treponema pallidum. It is a sexually transmitted disease and there are four stages. Primary, secondary, latent and tertiary. Primary syphilis is, the, is usually uh, presenting as a chancre at the site of infection. In secondary syphilis, we see rash. Latent syphilis, when if the secondary syphilis is left untreated, the rash will resolve and the patient will go in a latent stage. Tertiary syphilis is the is supposed to be the end stage and which there is extensive organ damage, dementia, and paralysis. It can lead to death. So our case was 
secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis is a generalized infection. It follows two to six weeks after primary infection and it is seen in about one in four people who have untreated primary syphilis. They will go into secondary syphilis. If left untreated, this can last for almost six months. Various lab serological tests are done for confirmation like VDRL, RPR, T, TPPA that is Treponema pallidum passive particle agglutination assay. On skin biopsy, we can find necrotic keratinocytes but that, is, uh, that may or may not be seen in the epidermis. The most important thing is a heavy dermal lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate with end arthritis and with or without small vessel thrombosis. So the take home message is a proper history and physical examination as well as diligent laboratory and diagnostic testing is a must for appropriate diagnosis and hence timely management. Correct diagnosis is frequently delayed because of rarity of some conditions and clinical similarity to many others. So if you have the knowledge of these conditions, you know how these things go about and you make a, a, a whole case by good clinical pathological correlation, you will give a good diagnosis. So these were my five cases which were which I found interesting, a bit rare and uh, uh, in, involved, uh, seen in the younger age group and in younger patients and young adults. So these are some of these are hence interesting and rare. So this, this was my all about my presentation and uh, if in case there is any query, uh, please you can respond to this. Uh, seminar itself. Thank you so much.